section that we didn't fit into the first unit that we'll be including into the second unit. We read about Jesus healing and the great crowds who, who follow him. In fact, that's how the 8th chapter of Matthew starts out, that after he came down from the mountain, that is where he gave the Sermon on the Mount, there are great crowds following him. In this crowd, on this day, one is a leper. He was a victim of a serious skin disease. It was one that Jewish law required quarantine, and that man, even though he probably shouldn't be out in public, he comes to Jesus and he says, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Look how Jesus heals the leper. First of all, he reaches out and touches him. That in itself is a dramatic event. Jesus then says, I will, meaning I am willing, I will be clean, and then his leprosy is immediately cleansed. Matthew gives us a note here, and we find it elsewhere in the Gospels, that Jesus doesn't want this miracle news spread, and so he tells the man not to tell anybody. He tells him to just go through the normal mosaic priestly ritual. It seems that Jesus knew he had to time his public work. You remember he had to leave uh, Judea and come up to Jerusalem once his popularity was growing. And now great crowds are following him and he doesn't want this miracle spread about. I do want you to know that this next slide is going to have some things you might not want to look at, and they are obscured for now. Uh, on the right side, you can see uh, the dimmed images of various skin diseases. The ones on the top, the top three, are all uh, actually severe cases of psoriasis and eczema. For years, people have said that perhaps the skin diseases of the Bible uh, were broad-term skin diseases, and when we read leprosy, it may apply to many, many things. And scholars may still think that about uh, Old Testament references to leprosy. However, the bottom picture on the right is a picture of a modern case of leprosy called Hansen's disease. Until the year 2000, in modern times, people were saying that that's a very specific disease today and we can't exactly equate it with the lepers of the New Testament. Well, that changed in the year 2000, and on the left you see a picture of a tomb that was discovered in the year 2000. Uh, at the bottom you can see not the same uh, burial chamber, but you can see the kinds of vaults they were. The one top is the actual burial chamber, and as um, unpleasant as it may be, those two smallest pictures are pictures of finger bones. These finger bones were submitted to... Uh, molecular analysis and carbon dating, and they indeed are the bones of a person who had leprosy, who lived somewhere between the year 1 and the year 50 AD. So there were indeed lepers in Judea, in that region, in the time of Jesus. Now I'm going to click on the slide, and this will remove the obscure uh, cover over the images, and if you don't want to watch those, you don't want to see them, look away and I'll tell you when the next slide is up. But I'm going to uh, uncover those pictures now. As I mentioned, the top three are modern cases of severe eczema and psoriasis. That's what we normally picture when we think of someone having leprosy, the, uh, the flaky white skin. The bottom is a picture of modern leprosy and you can see that this virus has, has caused uh, tubular growth. Uh, there are many pictures that are much more frightening than this. It can be a terrible, terrible disease, but it can be cured today. Back then, people were so concerned with all skin diseases that if leprosy were suspected, uh, there were actual laws of Moses that had to be observed to deal with that. Now we're going to move on to the slide, which doesn't have a picture like that. It has a beautiful picture of Capernaum. You may remember that in Matthew chapter 4, after Jesus was rejected in Nazareth, 
It says that leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea. This is a picture of Capernaum by the sea. This, that is the Sea of Galilee. Uh, the um, octagonal structure that you see in the upper left quadrant is a church built over what is believed to be the house of Peter. At the near center of the picture is a synagogue with a sub-foundation that goes back to the time of Christ. This is where Jesus lived when he was seeking his public ministry. Well, it is a centurion in Capernaum who asks Jesus to perform the next miracle that we read about in Matthew. He has a servant that he cares greatly about, but he tells Jesus that he's unworthy for Jesus to come into his house. He recognizes that Jesus is a man of authority and he can do whatever, uh, whatever he commands. Uh, a centurion would have been a Roman uh, officer, perhaps a non-commissioned officer, who would command a hundred. Jesus praises this man's faith. He says he hasn't found so great a faith in all of Israel. And he teaches that this represents uh, people who, in the Old Testament, were, were shown to be faithful, and they, they weren't even the people of Israel. Uh, he says that he has great faith. Uh, it's compared to uh, the faith uh, that the Queen of Sheba had when she came to, to see uh, Solomon. Uh, it's compared to uh, Naaman who was healed uh, and he wasn't an Israelite. But Jesus is able to heal the man serpent immediately. Jesus is living in Peter's house. You see at the bottom a picture of that structure that uh, I told you. There's a church built over it now. And uh, it is, uh, this has an octagonal structure around it. it uh, there are all kinds of reasons to believe that it, it was the house of Peter. It's, it was a large house, some rooms as big as 23 feet by 21 feet. In this miracle, Jesus seems to be responding to a personal uh, need, not, not just uh, making a point about who he is. Uh, beginning in verse 14, when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she rose and began to serve him. And then it tells that there are many, many people who came to be healed, and it was a fulfillment of what Isaiah had said. Uh, he took our illnesses and bore our diseases. Jesus then teaches an important lesson on the demands of discipleship. Jesus saw a crowd around him and he gave orders to go over to the other side. And a scribe came up to him and said, Teacher, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another disciple said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Follow me, and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Jesus says that following him will be demanding. He's going to cross over to a more deserted place across the Sea of Galilee. And so we pick up in verse 23. He got into the boat. His disciples followed him. And there arose a great storm on the sea so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But he was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we're perishing. And he said to them, Why were you afraid? Oh, you of little faith. Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? What kind of man is this? It's 
very interesting when we study about the disciples and the boat to know that in 1986 there was found buried in the mud at a time when the um, water was very, very low. They found buried in the mud this ship, which dates to the first century, on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. It's uh, 25 uh, feet long, uh, 7 feet wide. It was big enough to hold a crew of five and carry 15 additional persons. And so we have a sample of a boat that could have carried easily the 12 apostles. So we know kind of what vessel they were in. And here is a reconstructed version of that same vessel uh, to give you an idea uh, of, of what they were sailing in when it was filling up with water. When he gets across, he goes to an area uh, on the other side of uh, the Sea of Galilee that he's kind of leaving the Jewish territory. And there he casts out demons that are in two men who don't much want Jesus casting them out. So we pick up in verse 28. When he came to the other side, to the country of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men met him, coming out of the tombs so fierce nobody could pass that way. And they cried out, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come to torment us before the time? The demons know who Jesus is, and they seem to know that it's not the time that he's going to completely overcome their their kind, the demons, and just as we've noticed that Jesus doesn't seem to think it's time for uh, him to be completely uh, well known in public. And so he agrees to something very odd. He agrees to let the demons enter a herd of pigs. They uh, ask him to put them in the herd of pigs, and the pigs go and jump into the water and drown. Well, the people who are taking care of the pigs, obviously aren't Jewish, Jews don't raise pigs, uh, they run, afraid, tell everybody about these demon-possessed men who are now uh, healed, and everybody comes out to Jesus, and they are so overcome with the miracle that they just, they just beg him to, to leave their region. Moving into chapter 9. Jesus performs a healing. People bring a paralyzed man to him. Now notice it says he is in his own city, that it's Capernaum is his home now. And the first response he makes to the paralyzed man isn't about his paralysis. He says, your sins are forgiven. Again, Jesus is taking control of the situation for his own purposes. He tells us that he is using the healing to show that he can forgive. There are some scribes in the crowd, and Jesus knows what they're saying among themselves. And that is, it's blasphemy for a man to say that he forgives somebody. And so Jesus knows their hearts, and he challenges them. He says to those skeptics, which is easier, to say, walk, or to say, you're forgiven. Obviously, if, if you tell someone to walk who's never been able to walk, you've done a miracle. If you tell somebody they're forgiven, there's really no way you can determine if that's true or not. So he tells a man to get up and walk, and he does. It's immediately cured. Jesus says that he does the miracle that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive. Sins. And then it says people are amazed at his authority. So now Jesus is saying that the reason he's doing the miracles is to draw, atten is to draw attention to the forgiveness that he's authorized. To Next we run into the calling of Matthew. Most people are familiar with the calling of the, uh, the fisherman. Matthew is a tax collector, evidently, for the Roman Empire, uh, and evidently in Capernaum. The tax collectors were looked down on 
not just because people didn't like to pay taxes, but they particularly did not like to pay taxes to the Romans. And the Roman system was pretty much you got a certain amount of taxes to collect, and whatever more you can get out of them, you can keep. So, when Matthew gives a banquet with his associates and Jesus comes to it, Jesus is criticized by people who say, what kind of holy man is that sharing meals with the tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answers them with a lesson that we all need sometime. When he heard it, verse 12 of chapter 9, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. We want to learn what this means. Then he quotes the prophets. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. A lesson for all of us to be like Jesus, to see where our mission is. The disciples of John the Baptist are curious why the disciples of Jesus do not fast. John lived that ascetic life, and his disciples evidently gave a great deal of attention to fasting as well. Uh, probably in the morning of the sins of the nation. And Jesus explains that that's just not appropriate to the situation. He says there will be a time for sadness, but that is not now. Uh, it's like being with a bridegroom. The days will come. People will be moved to fasting, but they're not just going to put on the ritual and have so much to be happy about. He says to be fasting when it's a time of joy is like patching an old garment with a new cloth. Now, if you are not familiar with fabrics and sewing, you don't know that uh, fabric shrinks. And if one has been washed several times and the other one hasn't, then they're not going to match as you, as you continue to wash them. The new cloth is going to shrink up and pull the, the mend in an ugly, puckered way. He also says it's like putting new wine in old wineskins. Wineskins were exactly what it sounds like. They were skins that held wine. As they got old and brittle, they couldn't put up with the fermentation, and new wine that is fermenting could burst the wineskins open. It's just, it's just not appropriate to the situation. And that's what he says about fasting while they're there with Jesus. It's just not appropriate to the time. None of the four gospel writers pretends to tell all the works that Jesus did. In fact, John tells us the world couldn't hold the book if you wrote down every good thing Jesus did. But in chapter 9, Matthew has a section where he's just showing miracle on top of miracle. There is a synagogue official who requests that Jesus raise his daughter from the dead. And on his way there, a woman with a hemorrhaging problem comes up to him, and she hopes that if she can just touch the hem of his garment, that maybe she can be healed. And Jesus notices what she does, and he says that her faith has made her whole. Well, Jesus goes on to do the miracle that he was asked to do. He says, um, uh, when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making commotion, he said, go away. The girl's not dead, she's sleeping. And they laughed at him. When the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. And the report of this went through all that district. Everybody knew that the girl had died, and Jesus saying, it's not permanent. It's like she's asleep because he knew that he was going to heal her. That spread news about Jesus. Another miracle. He encounters a mute, demon-possessed man. And he heals him. Some are amazed, but others are beginning to object.
They say that maybe he's doing this by the prince of demons. That's verse 34. The Pharisees said he cast out demons by the prince of demons. Surely this is why Jesus didn't want the fame to spread yet. He knew what um, tension it was going to bring between him and the religious establishment. Then Jesus expresses his great compassion for the lost. Rather a summary statement, it says, beginning in verse 35, And Jesus went through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and affliction. He saw the crowds. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. For they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And that's what the next section is going to start with where he appoints his apostles to go and reap the harvest. Well, before we go there, I want us to make a chronological note. As you put together the different accounts of the four Gospels, they seem to come together at this point, so that what we read about in John chapter 5 matches what we're reading in chapters 8, 9, and 10. Here's how we figure that Jesus had a public life of about three years. There was a period before that first full year where he had a fairly private ministry, the stuff that John records up before chapter 2 and verse 13. And then in chapter 2, in verse 13, we have that first cleansing of the temple that John tells us about and the others don't. And it says that was at Passover. Well, Passover comes once a year. When you get to chapter 5 and verse 1, which we're about to look at, it says that he's gone to Jerusalem again for a festival, very likely being another Passover. So a year has passed between John 2.13 and John 5.1, so he begins his second year at this point that we're going to pick up. And John then gives us another marker of a Passover, just a chapter later in chapter 6 and verse 4, where he's feeding the 5,000, and that also is at Passover. Now the last year uh, has more details in John. The feeding of the 5,000 is in the Passover, in the spring. He makes another trip to Jerusalem at the Feast of Tabernacles, which is in the fall. Another at the Feast of the Dedication, which is in the winter. And then it all comes together at Passover, when Jesus is crucified. So there are the three years, and we pick up the marker then as we move into John this is an interesting healing uh, in that we have uh, a place I'd love to see, the Pool of Bethesda. There were a number of pools all around the Jerusalem temple, and there are remains of many of them that have been uncovered. It was considered only appropriate if one were to enter the, the sacred precincts that you would uh, clean up, certainly wash your feet, uh, probably immerse yourself in water to get completely clean before you would actually go into the temple precincts. One of these pools was a rather large one at Bethesda. It's described in great detail, and uh, most uh, scholars would agree that we know where it was. Uh, the picture you see is looking down into the pool uh, over the uh, last 2,000 years, a number of things have been built on top of each other, uh, including a church that is partially over this pool. But you can look down and you can see by the descriptions in the text and, and you can see by what's there that this was a very 
large pool. And we're told that there's this 30, this man who has for 38 years been lame all his life, and he waits by the pool because he's expecting a miracle. Now, he seems to have believed a story that um, the Bible doesn't endorse, but that would seem to be what he believed. And uh, he believed that if an angel came down and stirred the water, the first one in could be healed. But he doesn't have anybody to put him in the water, and he can't walk. And Jesus comes and offers to heal him, and it's on the Sabbath. Well, the Jews criticized the man, and they criticized Jesus harshly for working on the Sabbath. And Jesus says he's working because his father is working in the miracle. Now there's a very important note at the end of this section. It says that the Jews intensify their efforts to kill him for claiming God as his father, this special relationship. Now we'll look more closely uh, in, the, in another uh, session at the claims that he makes about uh, his relationship to the Father. But understand he's had this public life of a year. There's another year that's going to continue. But in that time, he has people who are out to kill. The fifth chapter of John particularly beginning in verse 19, is an important theological passage, more particularly an important passage for Christology, the study of exactly who Jesus is. In John chapter 5, in response to the challenges that Jesus should not have healed on the Sabbath, Jesus begins explaining his claim to be equal with God. This is an early claim. It grows clearer later. There are many references to plots that begin to develop to kill Jesus. Uh, if we could skip ahead for just a moment to John chapter 10, you can see a, a point at which it's grown very clear that uh, this is what is provoking people to want to get rid of Jesus. Go to John uh, chapter 10 and verse 30. Jesus says, I and the Father are one. The Jews pick up stones again to stone them. Jesus answered them, I've shown you many good works from the Father, for which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. This was their complaint. If Jesus were making a false claim to be God, you could understand their opposition. Even today, you know that there are those who take such offense at some challenges to what people believe to be divine that they would kill over it. It was certainly true for the claims that Jesus made. And as you develop your Christology, your understanding of who Jesus is, you need to take seriously these claims that John records of Jesus claiming an equality with God. It makes all the difference in what the gospel means to you. Back to our immediate text. Based on um, Swindle's writings and others, uh, I put it into a short outline of what Jesus is saying in verses 19 through 29. These, of course, are not the exact words of Jesus, but this is put this way to help you 
you see what startling claims Jesus is making. He claims, I'm equal with God. He claims, I am the source of life. I am the final judge. I will raise the dead. If you heard an individual saying those things, you would find it startling that any person would claim to be able to do such things. Back to verses 19 and 20. The argument that Jesus is making, if you'll look in your text, is that he's not doing things as himself. He sees what God is doing, and he does what God does, and God shows him what to do, and he's going to do even greater works than they see. So he claims an equal level with God at that point. Now, listen to how he also equates himself with God in verse 21 of John chapter 5. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. Again, putting himself on the same level as God. He goes on to say that God has actually made Jesus the final judge. Verse 22, and he's connecting this with uh, giving life and death, eternal life and death. Verse 22 says, The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son, does not honor the Son. who sent him. He is calling on people to realize that they will ask in the day of judgment to him that God has passed on judgment to him truly truly I say to you whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life but he who does, does not he does not come into judgment but has passed from death to life he's saying all the difference for eternal life is whether you believe me or not The last part of the chapter deals with witnesses to verify why people should believe what Jesus says about himself. And he calls these various witnesses God the Father, and within those verses a reference to John the Baptist, the miraculous sign, the scriptures themselves, including Moses. So go back to verse 32 now. There is another, he says in verse 31, it's not just me saying this. There's another one who bears witness about me. And I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. Let's get down to verse 36. The testimony that I have is greater than that of John, for the works the Father has given me to accomplish. The very works that I am doing bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. The Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard, his form you've never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one who sent me. It says very plainly that God the Father testifies to who he is. Backing up to verse 33, he gives them something more tangible. He says, you said to John, and he borne witness to the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp. And you're willing to rejoice for a while in his light. So they consulted John the Baptist. John the Baptist confirmed who Jesus is. It was mentioned in particular in verse 36 that the works that he does, the miraculous signs that he does, testify to who Jesus is. He picks up another thing in verse 39. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. I don't receive glory from people, 
No, no, you don't have the love of God within you. Come in my Father's name, you don't receive me. Somebody else comes in his own name, you receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not see the glory that comes from the only God? Verse 39 speaks of Pharisees, of those who would take great pride in how they handle Scripture. Jesus is not putting down the use of Scripture. He's saying, you're so proud of how much you know about Scripture, but you miss what Scripture teaches. Scripture teaches about the Christ, about Jesus. He says, they're just taking human pride in how they handle the Scriptures. And then, of course, uh, it relates to Scripture. But Jesus concludes in verse 45, Don't think that I'll accuse you to the Father. There's one who accuses you, on whom you've set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you'd believe me. For he wrote of me. If you don't believe the writing, how will you believe my words? He's attacking at the very core of their pride in being the custodians of God's revealed word in the Hebrew scriptures in the Old Testament. But he says, Moses himself, the one in whom you define your identity, he wrote me. You didn't get it from the scriptures, you're not going to get it when I tell you. So, we're coming to a point in John's Gospel, we see clear that it came earlier than the end of his life. We're all aware of plots against Jesus at the end of his life. But perhaps a year earlier, sometime in that time frame, Jesus has been claiming to be equal with God. And that is so offensive to de devoted Jewish leaders that they simply cannot abide it. And they think that they'll have to do away with Jesus. That's central to Christology. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus commissions his apostles to go out and represent him in spreading the gospel. This is the first of two commissions we call the second one, the Great Commission. And that comes at the end of the gospel. In this one, Jesus names some of his disciples to be his apostles. Sometimes people uh, confuse the two words because they're both used in reference to the same people. Disciple simply means a follower of a certain teacher. From among those followers, Jesus showed, chose special representatives, and those are called apostles. The twelve apostles are listed in various places in the gospel, and in Acts, and sometimes they use their first name, and sometimes they use their middle name, sometimes they use the nickname. But these are the common groupings. Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew. James, Simon the Zealot, Thaddeus, and always the last one is listed as Judas who betrayed him. Jesus at first tells his disciples to go only to those of the lost house of Israel, those lost sheep of the house of Israel. And the message is to be preaching that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You will, of course, remember that that was the message that Jesus was proclaiming. We're defining kingdom as the rule of God, not a political entity, not just a group of people, but the realm in which people live under the rule of heaven. He tells them to go out and that they'll be healing and that they're to depend on local people to support their work. And when they run into someone that's not willing or to a city where no one's willing to keep them, that they're just to shake the dust off their feet and move on to where somebody is more receptive. As he sends them out, he tells them that it will be challenging for them to do what he is requesting of them. He says, beginning in verse 16 of chapter 10, 
Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. He tells them that they can be, they can expect to be taken to court and even to be scourged, which is the absolute worst form of beating you can imagine. He tells them that they can expect that opposition will come from the local synagogue and governments will oppose them. But what he tells them to do in that circumstance is to let the Spirit tell them what to say in their defense. In other words, you don't have to worry about these trials. God will, in a very special way, give you what you need to say when those trials come up. And then he says something that is quite challenging. He says to expect opposition to come even from within your own house. But his message to them is to just keep on going until the Son of Man returns. It is a sad truth that when people bring change, other people resist. If you're changing within your family, people within your family will resist. If you're telling a synagogue that something new is happening, they'll want to keep the old. If you're making change in society, the government will see what's going on here. And they are told that this bringing in the rule of God will be such a radical change that it will be threatening to all these parts of society, and that will make their work a challenge. And then he tells them to stand up bravely to whatever challenges they may face. And in verse 24, a disciple is not above his master, nor a servant, above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It's enough for the disciple to be like his teacher, and the servant to be like his master. They call the master of the house the elves of all. How much more will they malign those of this household? So they're calling Jesus' names. They're saying that he uh, cast out demons by the prince of the demons that they call the elves of all. And so the apostles can surely expect if they insult their leader, they will insult his representative. But he tells them to shot it from the rooftop anyway. Have no fear of them. Nothing is covered that won't be revealed or hidden that won't be known. What I tell you in the dark, say it in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetop. Don't fear those who kill the body but can't kill the soul. Fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Aren't two sparrows sold for a penny? Not one of them fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are not there. Don't fear you're more value than many sparrows. So go on, shout it from the rooftop. Don't be afraid. Yes, they can threaten you, but God is the one you need to fear. The Father who notices every sparrow has the very hairs of your head on He is watching very closely for you. Then Jesus begins to say which people are his people. He's going to claim or disown people in the end in front of the Father in heaven. And so a very important two verses, verses 32 and 33, Jesus says, So, everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father, who is in heaven. We say that everyone who's going to be saved must confess Christ. This person uses the word acknowledge him, that is, claim to belong to him. And after warning the apostles that many people will reject them, he says, so are you going to claim to be mine anyway? If you do, I'll stand up for you on the last day. I'll claim you as mine. And then he adds to the negative. But if you deny that you belong to me, that you are with people, then when you stand before the Father in the end, I'll deny that you belong to me. He continues to build on the challenge of being a disciple. 
But in the process, he says, if he's going to claim those as his own, who put him first. And he warns them that loyalty to him is going to disrupt some families. Do not think that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. I've come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemy will be those of his own household. You don't love anybody more than you love your family. The point that is, you've got to love Jesus more than you love anybody. And he says that in so many words, beginning in verse 37. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And then, surely he's saying the same thing in a different way. He says, whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Of course, there's much more to that truth. But here, in context, if you won't take the cross, choosing Jesus, even when your family is dead, then you're not worthy of him. And then he says, whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake, will find it. He's saying in so many ways that choosing to follow Jesus is making a radical choice different from the people around you. And you've got to choose him first, whether people accept that or not. Then he says, in a positive way, that he will bless those who receive his people. Whoever receives you, receives me. Whoever receives me, receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet, because he's a prophet, will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person, because he's a righteous person, will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones, even a cup of cold water, because he's a disciple, truly, I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. So after warning that there will be those who reject the people for following Jesus, he goes on to say, that he's going to reward those. There will be those who receive and, and uh, make gestures of kindness to his people. He's going to bless those. As we've read before, Jesus has come into more prominence and is making more disciples than John the Baptist had been making. And John the Baptist has now been put in prison by Herod. John seems to have grown um, depressed, doubtful. Uh, he's sending out word to Jesus. It must have been something for such a dynamic personality to be in prison and unable to do anything. And so he sends people to Jesus to basically ask him, well, are you the one? He says, are you the one who is in to come, who is to come, or shall we look for another? And he sends back a message to his forerunner, his cousin. He sends the message, you tell John about the miracles I'm doing. You tell him how I'm preaching to the poor. And that is the message of saying, yes, I am the one. And then he pronounces a blessing on those who are not offended by me. So I guess even John has his doubt. And in spite of the miracle, and perhaps because he's reaching to the underprivileged, to the poor, he knows that some people are not going to like the way he is. Less of those who are not offended by me. And he's going to expand on that thought as he talks about John the Baptist. So he tells the crowd about John the Baptist. What did you go out of the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Look, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What you go out to see? A prophet. Yes, and I tell you, more than a prophet. 
This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. And the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than him. So he's honoring the mission of John the Baptist. He says this isn't just any prophet. This is the one who's going to prepare the way for the Lord to come in and set up his rule, his kingdom. And he recognizes and emphasizes that John was not the fancy kind of preacher that they were looking for. And he says, they're as good as they get this side of the kingdom. He's making two points, that John the Baptist was leading into the kingdom and what a blessing it will be for all of us who can be in the kingdom. And he's saying he is the ultimate prophet predicting the coming of the kingdom as opposed to Jesus who is announcing now the kingdom is being set up. He goes on and talks about other people's attitudes about God's kingdom. There were many mistaken ideas of what that would be. He says, from the day Next, Jesus pronounces some woes on cities close to where he lived. You see on that map, he's going to speak to Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. Remember, Capernaum is his hometown, and you can see that these other cities are not far away. He pronounces woes on them. That is, uh, doom is coming your way, beginning in verse 20. Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they didn't repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For the mighty works done in you have been done in Tyre and Sidon. Those are Gentile cities. They would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it'll be more tolerable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you and you. Capernaum. Will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you, it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. Well, these people lived around Jesus. They saw his miracles and they still didn't repent. Sodom, that city that God destroyed for great wickedness with fire from heaven. In the judgment day, they'll be in better shape than the people who lived around Jesus, saw his miracles, and still did not repent. Then Jesus turns to a prayer, recognizing the rightness of God and allowing things to be the way they are. His thanks to God seems to be thanking God for leaving his wisdom to people who are open and not to those who are proud. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. He's thankful to God that he's just hidden from these supposedly wise people what even a little child could see and understand. And then he begins to make important claims. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal. Only he knows the Father. Only he can reveal the Father. And then in that beautiful invitation that's been so beautifully put into music in our time, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from you. Find gentle, lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So in something of a conclusion to all of his challenges, that it will 
be demanding to be his disciple. He then ends up saying that his burden is light, relatively, compared to the burden that people carry from their everyday labors and their personal burdens, he will give rest. That beautiful phrase, rest for your soul, is yoke. It is a yoke. You're bound in service to him. But it's a light burden compared to the burden of a troubled soul. The conflict increase in chapter 12. The conflict seems to focus on the Sabbath. Jews are not allowed to work on the Sabbath. Well, it turns out that on a Sabbath, Jesus and his disciples are walking through a grain field, and as was allowed in, uh, in Jewish culture, uh, they pick a few pieces of grain, and I understand what you would do then is you kind of rub them in your hands to uh, sort of toast them a little bit, and you'd have a little snack. Well, the Pharisees who are out to uh, get Jesus, they say, look, your disciples are doing what it's not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Well, Jesus tells them that they are imposing more than God has imposed. He refers to a story when King David was running for his life. And he came to the priest, and the priest gave him bread that was uh, reserved only for the priest. He talks to them about the fact that there are priests who have to work every Sabbath in the temple. He tells them they're just taking this too literally. Then he makes a claim that must have been shocking to them when he talks about the priests in the temple, in verse 5 of chapter 12. Haven't you read in the law how the, on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath? And they're guiltless. I tell you, something greater than the temple is he. He's talking about himself. Remember that when he cleared the temple, according to uh, the early chapters in John, that he said, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. He's speaking of the temple of his body. And now he's saying he is greater than the temple. And then he goes back to the prophets again, these Pharisees. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guilt. That is, the Lord had commanded through his prophets. He was more interested in merciful people and people who go through all the rituals. Then he makes it clear what he said. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. He is in a position to, to say what is and isn't right uh, on the Sabbath. And then he demonstrates that you should do good on the Sabbath. That's not the kind of work that God was restricting. So he goes into their synagogue, evidently the Pharisee synagogue, the slide has it wrong there, it says temple, it should say synagogue. And it looks like the Pharisees want to trick him because they know he does miracles. And so there's this man with a withered hand, and so they ask Jesus in their synagogue, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And it tells us that they did that so that they might accuse him. So Jesus answers, which one of you, if you have a sheep that falls into a pit on the Sabbath, won't take hold of it and lift it out? How much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Hmm. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand, and he did, and it was restored. Don't be like the other. Verse 14 is significant. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. The plot of becoming crystallized. They want to get rid of Jesus. Jesus would prefer not to be as much the center of attention at this point in his public life, evidently. And we see that he wants to quietly heal people. 
verse 15, after this uh, synagogue encounter, Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there. And many followed him, and he heals them all, and ordered them not to make it known. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he'll proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor let anyone hear his voice in the street. Listen to this beautiful language. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench, until he brings justice to victory. And in his name, the Gentiles will hope. Jesus is the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecies of the song of the suffering servant. That beautiful, beautiful statement. Sometimes people are so down that they're like a candle that's nothing left but a smoldering wick that you could just squeeze with your fingers and put it out. That Jesus isn't going to do that. He's going to lead justice to victory, and he's going to give hope to everybody, the Gentiles as well as the Jews. He still faces opposition. He's getting out of the public eye as much as he can, but the crowds are still following him. Verse 22, a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute was brought to him, so he healed him. The man saw and spoke. And then the miracle has its intended purpose in, in affirming who Jesus is. All the people were amazed and said, can this be the son of David? Everybody's looking for the descendant of David to retake the throne of Israel. The Pharisees don't want them thinking of Jesus as the heir of David. When the Pharisees heard it, they said, it's only by the else of all the prince of demons that this man casts out demons. Well, Jesus knows what they're thinking, and he argues against their thinking. He says, that's a kingdom divided against itself. Verse 26, if Satan casts out Satan, he's divided against himself. How's his kingdom going to stand? And he says to these critics who have uh, their own people who claim to do exorcism, if I cast out demons by the eligible, by whom do your sons cast them out? They can be your judges. And then very importantly in verse 28. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come. Uh, you get the significance of that. He's saying, I am doing miracles. Miracles that you can't deny. God himself is causing these miracles. So that means God's kingdom is now come. And then he goes on and says, you know, I couldn't be defeating the demons if I hadn't bound Satan. It's like you can't go in and rob a strong man's house unless you bind the man. And then two important statements. Verse 30, whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me gathers. Yeah. Might want to make a note of that. That important verse is not uh, covered in your outline. And it's very important. You're either on his side or you're working against him. And then a verse that uh, we won't give a lot of time to, but a lot of people have questions about. And again, it's not on your uh, slide outline. Therefore, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people. But the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. The best thing to do to make sure you understand what this is all about is put it in its context. Jesus is telling people who deny that his miracles come from God's Spirit. In other words, deny that they're really miraculous, that this is heaven speaking. There's no hope for them. 
After this life, they'll still be good. They didn't believe what heaven proved. So, when you talk about the unforgivable sin, don't get distracted by what it is. It's people who deny that God has affirmed Jesus, who was in human form, to be the one who's bringing in this kingdom. If you deny that, then you're denying the Spirit who gave the sign that proves who he was. He goes on and he severely criticizes the, uh, the Pharisee. He calls them, verse 34, a brood of vipers. How can you speak uh, good because you're evil? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And he says, in verse 36, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you'll be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. So he puts them in their place. He's bringing in God's kingdom. They're rejecting God's kingdom. There's no hope for them in the end, because God has proven through his spirit. But this is his function. He does these miracles. They say the miracles come from the devil. And those words will come back to condemn them. But they want to continue the argument. Verse 38, some of the scribes and Pharisees answered and said, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. He evidently doesn't believe they want to see it for the right reason. He answered and said, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. But no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That's a, a challenge. Now we've got to get the sign of Jonah. So Jesus connects his burial and resurrection, being three days and nights inside the earth, to the three days that Jonah was inside the great fish in the, wheel, in, the, in the whale. That's going to be the ultimate sign, his resurrection. And then he condemns them. He tells them they're foreigners that responded to God better than you people do. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. Something greater than Jonah. Is here. Queen of the South will rise up at judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold, something greater than Solomon. Is here. He's saying they'll be condemned if they don't believe. Once the resurrection comes, they don't believe that he is who he says he is. There's no hope for them. Why? The pagan people of Nineveh repented when Jonah preached to them. The foreigner queen of Sheba was impressed with the wisdom of Solomon. And Jesus makes the claim that he is one greater than Jonah, greater than Solomon. And they're rejecting him. In verses 43 through 45, he uses an interesting illustration to talk about these people are just making more room for evil. He talks about uh, a spirit uh, leaving a person, can't find anywhere to go, so has to go back where he came from. And all that person has done is empty himself of the evil spirit and everything connected with him. He hasn't put anything positive in its place. And it says, then it goes and brings back with it seven other spirits more evil than itself. <clears throat> and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. So it's going to be with this evil generation. Since so many of his critics were the Pharisees and the scribes, you have to stop and wonder. Is he talking about their legalistic nitpicking? Is he talking about how that they're just against everything and they're not open to anything? But he sure is saying that they're not open to God's blessing. At the end of chapter 12, Jesus pulls together some of this that he's been talking about. We started with him talking about who his people are as he appoints his uh, apostle. And then he tells them that there'll be disturbances within families. And he says, you've got to love him more than family to be his father. 
Then at the end of this section, the actual physical family, the natural family of Jesus, shows up. While he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside and to speak to him. But there's some interesting details in that verse. First of all, he has brothers. We assume those are the half-brothers of Christ, other children of either Mary and Joseph or perhaps children of Joseph by an earlier marriage. But he has some half-brothers who are with his mother, and they're on the outside. They have to actually send someone in to see if they could talk to Jesus. And his reply is not what you would expect. He replied to the man who, who told him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? Stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. But whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. That's sad to read if you're the family of Jesus. But if you're the follower, then you're greatly honored that he recognizes you as his family. Jesus is demonstrating the ultimate loyalty that he requires of his disciples. You know, the relationship between Jesus and disciples surpasses even family relationships. 